Welcome to the Navigating Hollywood podcast. My name is Alan Wolf, and I'm a filmmaker and an author. Navigating Hollywood encourages and equips entertainment professionals to live relationally and spiritually holistic lives. If you work in entertainment, visit navigatinghollywood.org to discover how you can get involved. Today, we're joined by actor and writer Christopher Palaha. Christopher has been featured in Jurassic World Dominion, Wonder Woman 1984, Where Hope Grows, TV movies for the Hallmark Channel, and so many other films and TV series, including Mad Men, Get Shorty, and Backstrom. He has also co-authored two books from the series from Kona with Love. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Alan. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. One of your best credits is for the Wonder Woman 1984 movie, where your credit is Handsome Man. Right. <laughs> I love it. I want to be cast as Handsome Man. Yeah. I would be cast as Bald Man. <laughs> <laughs> like any any man, any, any cast, is... any man, any man. What was interesting about that is that a handsome man sort of became the male face of the Me Too movement in the most ironic of ways because obviously he didn't consent and and there was right December twenty fifth the movie dropped and all these people went to Twitter and and they were like this poor guy he was taken advantage of and I was like I mean no oh I don't know <laughs> no comment. <laughs> We're seeing Chris Pine, but she's actually not seeing Chris Pine. Yeah, it was a weird swap. Aside from you know Wonder Woman and the, and the man's entanglement, you, you had him like fighting and getting his body just beaten up, and so it was this whole thing of like this poor guy, like what happened? He's gonna wake up and be like, why am I sore? Why? What, what happened? But it's a movie it was, and a great experience. The gal was incredible to work with, and Patty is a genius and, and just wonderful to work with. So it was a fun experience. Mm. Oh, that's great. And it came out in the midst of the pandemic. And I remember what was then called HBO Max decided to put it on their platform first. How did that impact you? Dramatically, I'm going to be honest with you. When you have a movie and it gets a theatrical release, especially one that was projected to make a billion dollars in the box office, you split that profit margin by putting it into home theaters versus theaters, the movie only made 35 million domestically, and I think it ended up breaking 100 million globally. And then when something is broadcast on television, even if it's streaming, your residuals are chopped so significantly that it was like, I get residuals from you know an episode of Mad Men that were equal to Wonder Woman. It was basically like being on a TV show. So it's just, and it's interesting to see how, how the real world affects art. And how the and how art affects the real world because if you go back to the original Wonder Woman, the first movie, that was the thing that kicked off the Me Too movement. Go back to that summer of 2017 huh. and Wonder hmm. Woman and Ray Jenkins and all of that stuff. So there was this huge groundswell, and then it all kind of closed up with the second one. I mean, it was interesting if you go back and really look at it from a from an anthropological point of view, it fascinates me when a movie drops, when it has any kind of cultural significance and then what the follow-up is and what the ramifications are. And I remember sitting in the movie theater watching Wonder Woman, the, the first one, and I thought, man, I would love to be in the next one. I mean, I'd even be her boyfriend, like, doesn't matter. Like, and I remember just kind of like lifting up a little, a, little, a little prayer being like, come on, man. How cool would that be? And the story, the wow. way that was, I had auditioned for Patty Jenkins for a TV show back in 2013. And she brought me in five times. I tested five times for this show. And ABC kept saying, we don't want you. We don't want, he's not edgy enough. And she wrote me this wonderful letter that I'll, that I still have saved. And she was just like, you know, one of these days your ship will come in. She had a, mm. a bunch of wonderful stuff to say. And I, at the time replied and she said, thank you, but replied to that letter in 2017 and was like, Patty, you just crushed it with this movie. Like you didn't just make an amazing superhero movie. You made an incredible movie. And she wrote me back. We had a nice correspondence the weekend the movie debuted. This is Wonder Woman, the first one. February in 2018, I got this call to go to Warner Brothers. And they were like, they want to read you for this role. And I knew it was going to be relational because it was kind of like a role between a boyfriend and a girlfriend. And it was just me and the casting director. There were no other actors there. And it was kind of like 
Patty had this little part dog-eared for me, and it was a wonderful experience. It couldn't have been a cooler job. It was interesting to see how it all came out. Well, speaking of culture-changing movies, you were also featured in Jurassic World Dominion. <laughs> and you've known the director of that film, Colin Trevorrow, since your NYU days, which is where I actually went to film school. Did you look at this. I'm just rocking the... Oh my gosh, and you're wearing your NYU... T-shirt, amazing. <laughs> Did you have a sense back then that he would ever create such an epic movie? He and I would talk about movies. One was the trilogy of the Star Wars. So George Lucas came out with one, two, and three while we were in college. And Colin and I would talk about what was done right, what he thought was like, he's like, oh, they missed the mark on this, or who should have, what if we did this? And he was such a nerd about Star Wars and Jurassic Park, all the way back in 89, 98, 97, 96. And so when Jurassic World 3 came out, we went and watched the movie together, and we sat down, and he was like, okay, this was cool, and this was cool, but man, what they should do next? And he pitched, he literally pitched Jurassic World back in 2001. <laughs> So he yeah, had the whole all. thing dialed in. He's like, so now the dinosaurs will get off the island and they'll be in the world. You'll see Tyrannosaurus Rex in New York and there'll be, you know, pterodactyls in Japan. And he's like, and we'll call it Jurassic World. I mean, he literally like, he had the <laughs> oh whole thing. So he was 100% <laughs> the right guy to, to do that. And it was, again, a very cool experience because we filmed that during the pandemic. So we started in February of 2020. And when we got to set, there was, again, very little conversation, but Scott Hayes, who was in the movie with me, he was like, bro, you need to start putting, and he got me this hand sanitizer. He's like, you got to start washing your hands, man. He's like, I don't want to catch the germs. I don't want to catch whatever's going on. So there was all these kind of weird conversations. And then of course, March 7th happens, the world shuts down, the whole industry shut down. They then called me about two weeks later, so now we're in April. So we were the tip of the spear. We were the first production back. They said, this is what we're doing. We're going to put everybody in a hotel. We're flying everybody to the UK. We're going to test everybody three times a week. We're going to have incredible protocol to make sure everyone stays healthy. And we're going to make a movie. And so we went back to work in June of 2020. And they wrapped October 2020. And we all just lived at this place called the Langley in the UK. I mean, I had Bryce Dallas Howard as my neighbor for one part of it. And then when my family joined me, so my wife and kids came and joined me from for July and August and September. And then I was Jeff Goldblum's upstairs neighbor. I mean, it was the most surreal kind of experience. <laughs> oh, we had like four days of work or five days of work. So I had to work. Wow. And then I had a whole month off and then I would work again a couple of days and then I'd be off for another couple of weeks. And, and they would keep you there the whole time when you were off. Yeah, we were literally imprisoned in this beautiful hotel. Outside of that craziness, what was it like filming Jurassic World? I mean, outside of the fear of catching COVID, it was probably one of the coolest experiences I've ever had in my career because, like I said, we were stuck in this hotel. So every Friday night and every Saturday night, everybody went down to the terrace and everybody had dinner together. And there was such a sense of community that you never get because oftentimes your big A-list movie stars are going to go off and do their own private thing and people are going to click up and if you got your family or if you're shooting in town, like everyone just goes home after work. And so the opportunity to bond like that doesn't exist. Colin, you know, was living there. We played Frisbee on Sundays. <laughs> like every Sunday we would all go out and have this, you know, giant ultimate Frisbee game. I remember Sam Neill, it was his birthday and I was like, you want to go through, uh, we, we could, there were parks adjacent to the property that you could walk on because it was outside. Um, you had to avoid people, but you could be out in the wilderness at least. So I took Sam on a hike on his birthday and we just had this incredible conversation about how he got started as an actor and what his life is like and what it's been like. And and so for a guy who just loves making movies and telling stories and loves meet people, it was a really cool opportunity to to sink in and get to know the people you're working with. It's interesting because it, it shows where your priority is because I asked you how, what it was like filming Jurassic Park and the thing that really sticks out to you the most is the relational time. <laughs> You know, because maybe someone would be like, oh, yeah, it was cool with the dinosaurs and the green screen and everything. But you're like, oh, no, it's the people time that stays with you and that you love. And it's interesting because the movie part, you know, I mean, it kind of comes and goes, but it's those relationships that endure. So I just love that that's what came out as your priority. 
<laughs> That's cool. Thank you. Well, I, and the movie was fun. We had to act against all these different raptors. There were some that had actors that had the head on, and you would see, and they would walk through. You would see a head kind of cruise through, and, every, and they were dressed in the green screen. But mostly, the way that technology is now, it's gotten so advanced that they need to create a plate, but you can move within the plate, and you can just literally look and pretend that you're looking at it. And they give you a rough eye line, and they say, look at about, you know, and you just track your eyes across the room real nice and slow, and they can just digitally pop in a dinosaur. So you're really truly in <laughs> with midair, right. with space, with nothing. You began your career with a series of performances of the works of Eugene O'Neill on and off Broadway and at the Lincoln Center. How have his works impacted you? My whole career is, is because of a play I did that was written by Eugene O'Neill. I did a play called Bread and Butter. And it was Eugene O'Neill's first full-length play that he'd written, but it had never been produced. And so it was literally the world premiere of Eugene O'Neill's first full-length play. I got these you know, rave reviews and it launched my career. I got signed because of it. I had an agent oh, because wow. of it. Like It was the summer between my junior and senior year. And by October, I signed with Gersh. Oh, I, mean, I was out for the races. Like I was... That was auditioning for oh. Buffy the Vampire Slayer and popular. and But Eugene O'Neill, there was something about the depth with which he told stories and the pathos and the empathy and the darkness, because they were all very haunted. And by that, I mean in, in the way that the human heart can be haunted. But there was always this hope of redemption in all of the plays that he wrote. And being steeped in that stuff as a young actor has literally stained and colored the way that I approach everything. It sounds like he had an impact both in helping to launch your career, but just in your inner life and how you process roles and stories. When you're a young actor, you're going to have to cut your teeth on a few on a few different things. And some people cut their teeth on Shakespeare. Then they have this wonderful kind of like, yeah, I played Hamlet and I played this and they can quote things. And some people cut their teeth on Ibsen or Chekhov or, you know, the Russians where they go, yeah, this is naturalism. And this is sort of the beginning of, of the kind of storytelling that we know. And then you kind of jump into Tennessee Williams or David Mamet or Arthur Miller. And there's certain American playwrights that you kind of go from Chekhov and you leap to these other guys that were already established. Few people sort of dig into O'Neill, which his first play is about abortion. His second play is about a jealous mind, like all these one acts that he did. You can go through and they are just intensely human and extremely dramatic and heightened as high as you can go, but also based in this reality that like Tennessee Williams was hoping to touch and Miller was hoping to touch. And so when you really dig into the works of this guy, you can't help but be impacted I've read that 2% of actors are able to make their living as an actor, which is incredible to think about. What do you think has made a difference for you? There is one name that has made a difference for me, and I don't mean to, to get all Christian on you here, here on the front end, but Jesus, I don't think that if I didn't have the faith that I have, I don't think I would have had the tenacity and the courage and the gumption and the grit to stick with it through all of the hardships because it is not easy. It's not easy to get to a certain level. And when you achieve that, it's not easy to stay at that level and then to continue to push forward and grind out. I mean, as you know, it is a really tough, hard business. And when you're a young man at 24 and you get your first series, I made my first million dollars by the time I was 25 years old. And I lost it by the time I was 27. Think about that. Oh, like I was a millionaire, and then my house went into foreclosure. I've always been a working actor. Like, like I've always, like you just said, it's interesting. I'm in this two percent where I have not had another job other than acting since I was 23 years old, and I'm 46 now, so half my life. But I was a bus boy. I worked as a bellman in cas casinos. I installed refrigerators. I did the car wash. I mean, I did all of the the grind work and knew what it meant to really earn and work hard for your dollar. And then as an actor, when I got 
blessed enough to to start working and again because of that play in New York City I had this launch pad that none of my other peers had and something happened and I and that work ethic and that appreciation for it that has to be grounded in something and my faith is the thing that's kept me in line when all of the temptations of Hollywood when I was 24 and young and I had the world I mean literally like I was on a show called North Shore and we were living in Hawaii and all of the trappings, any any snare that you can mention was literally, a, it was a buffet of potential booby traps. It was my faith that kept me uh, like a mensch when I work with people to give them dignity, to give them respect. My wife and I, I you know, she met me before the rocket ship took off. Our marriage is literally the cornerstone of and the bedrock of all of it. And that wouldn't be possible if we weren't rooted in our faith. And I'll be honest with you. The good times, the success is actually harder than the failure. Harder in what way? I'll tell you. Did you see Top Gun Maverick this summer? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember the opening scene where he takes the jet to Mach 10? Right. And do you remember the jet starts to heat up and it starts to shake and it starts to Yes. <laughs> and everything starts to, and you can see him like holding on for dear life. Well, when you were in the white hot heat of a successful show or a moment in Hollywood where all eyes are on you and you've got a press circuit and you are constantly like three a day interviews and you're selling and you're moving and you've got everybody saying yes, 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 yes. In this way, I got to be honest with you, man, you start to, you start to become like that plane at Mach 10 and you're just like, okay, hold on to this. And it, it's in those moments where I start saying, Lord, this is yours. And you you give you, this is all yours. I've had nothing to do with this. So just give me grace and help me through this thing and help me keep my cool and help me keep my humility. And inversely, when you are broke and you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from and no, the phone isn't ringing. And I've been at this business long enough where I've had these waves of I've had these amazing highs. And then all of a sudden I'm like, what happened? What did I do? Did I offend somebody? Did I get blacklisted? Like what just happened? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, it really is these two moments at the extremes where you need something. Everybody's got this thing that they need. How did that faith journey begin? Well, I grew up in a household that had a lot of faith. My dad was Catholic. My mom was Pentecostal. Like she, you know, every little revival that would move through Reno, we were at these, you know, weekend long things. And really, <laughs> and is that something that you like doing as a kid or were you like, uh, another revival? No, I mean, honestly, there's some of them, like some of them were moving and some of them were embarrassing. Like some of them were uh -huh. like genuinely embarrassing. Or I remember I would bring my best friend Graham to Catholic church and I would be so embarrassed because stand kneel stand kneel and i was like oh like right. i was almost right. like ashamed you know i was embarrassed because because it was it it wasn't i was just it, you know i was a goofball but at the same time there was this inner life and i just prayed all the time i mean and i prayed to the holy spirit which was interesting i was always seeking wisdom and i was seeking communion with the holy spirit and then alan when i when i was 17 i prayed this prayer of pride, where I was so full of pride because I was the lead of all the school plays. My grades are really good. I had this beautiful girlfriend and I was like, you know, but it was almost like I just wanted a break. I was like, I'm just going to take a little break, God. I don't want to feel beholden to this relationship that I'm in with you. I was like, I'm just going to take a break, God. And that break then became my junior year, senior year. And then probably about six years of just kind of wandering through what I'll call the wilderness um, and still identifying as a Christian, but not behaving like a Christian. Two things happened in my life. The first one was uh, I was caught up in this blast in, in New York City. Someone was trying to burn their restaurant down and it blew up. I was with this this girl and she was on one side of me, I was on the other. And I moved. So there's like, I was prompted to switch sides with her. And then when the blast occurred, the explosion happened, we were somehow moved out of the way of danger. And I mean, I had 120 stitches, but she had none. And it was one of those things where it was just that I felt God's presence. And like, he literally saved my life. 
fire marshal came to the ER and was like, you know, you should be decapitated. You shouldn't be here right now. And my prayers after that, literally the only thing I could pray was, God, I want to go to you. I want to mm. go to you. I want to mm. go to you. I'm so hungry for relationship. And all of a sudden it was like a 180 and all I cared about was being in relationship. Then the play happens, uh, bread and butter happens. I'm fully represented. I auditioned for a hundred and probably 110 shows in the first year and I didn't book one of them. Like I got rejected 110 times in a row. So of course you're sitting there feeling, okay, am I right? Am I, should I be doing this? Am I any good? And then I got a pilot. And then I remember being in the trailer of uh, this, it was a little triple banger trailer. We were doing a pilot called Third Degree for Fox, my first job ever. And I remember falling on my hands and my knees and I remember the dirt and how dirty it was. And I just started praying that God would bring a woman into my life. And I was like, Lord, I'm, I'm ready. And if you're ready, like open my heart and prepare me and prepare someone's heart. And, I, you know, I want to have a relationship. Literally on April 18th, this was, I was filming in March. And two weeks later, I'm in LA. I meet this girl, Julianne. She ended up becoming my wife. And <laughs> her relationship <laughs> with God. And who she is as a person, it changed my life. And so these two, and almost in one season, like started with the blast and kind of moved all the way through to meeting her. And then our relationship, her relationship with God, which then informed my relationship as, as they do. Um, I mean, I started reading the Bible because I wanted to have authority. I, I wanted, to, I wanted to, have, to have something to contribute. So while I was a Christian, and it wasn't like I was converting or anything for her, she was a Christian, I was a Christian, we were equally yoked in, in several different ways, but there was something about her that made me want to catch up. There was something about the way she lived her life. God saved my life, and then he gave me a life. But the one thing that I just clung to, and it was a contrail of this thing that happened when I was a teenager, when I wanted acting so badly was I was never able to just completely give my career over to God. Like I would pray about everything, but but my career, I like I needed mm -hmm. to be the best actor. I needed to be the greatest actor of my generation. I needed to have the top, like I needed the mountaintop. And mm -hmm. I wasn't able to let that go. And it wasn't until 2017. And I used to have, we used to live in this place and there was a trail above our house and I would call it the Holy Road. And I would go on this trail every day because I was unemployed. And it got real lean again. Financially, we got real lean. And things were tough. I remember falling down on my hands and knees again on this dirt trail in this mud. A lot of Christians will feel this way. I think a lot of people feel this way. That when life is good and money's rolling in and things are happy, that you're being blessed. That God is blessing you. That God is smiling down upon you and giving you providence. And that when things are bad, that God's angry with you and that he's punitive and that he's withholding blessings because you're on the wrong path. And I had to learn this lesson that that's not the case. That sometimes we are going to, we are made to suffer and sometimes we are going to struggle and we are going to have hardships and we are not going to get the things that we want, not because God doesn't love us, but exactly the opposite because God does love us and he's refining us and he's putting us through these tests. And I remember standing in my son's bedroom that summer, that night, we, I would read, I was reading the entire Bible aloud to them while they fell asleep. And they were both asleep. Caleb and Mike were both asleep. I just stood in this bedroom and I started praying. And it was that night I said, Jesus, I just take my career. I want you to have it. Like, if you want me to, if, it, if, it, if I'm not supposed to be an actor, then take it and close the door and open another one and I'll walk through it wherever you want me to go. I'll go. And then the Wonder Woman happened. And then, I mean, and then it was like Hallmark happened. I mean, all these things, it was like the phone, like the day that I got the Hallmark call, I was in a pool. I mean, broke, dude. I can't even explain it. I had 80 bucks. I had enough money to go either buy a take of gas to get to an audition or buy food for my family. And I got a phone call and it was an offer to do Dater's Handbook with Meghan Markle. And it was like, yeah. And it was an answer to prayer. I mean, I literally was crying. Dude, I don't, I've never said this to anybody. I literally was praying 
I wasn't angry at God and I wasn't angry at myself. I wasn't fearful of like, I was just gobsmacked with confusion. I was polaxed. I was like, what God? And my phone rang. Like no sooner did I say, Lord Jesus, I, I need a job. I need work. And my phone rings and it's my agent. He's like, hey, I got an offer for you. And I'm like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and of course I like left into it. And so it was one of those things where like, you know, you can't, you can't separate the, your faith from the facts because the facts are the faith. I love that you're talking about the good parts and the parts that don't feel as good because I think people can have a perception of it either being wonderful all the time or people just not thinking there's a value to faith. And so it's really interesting just hearing how your faith has just impacted you in such a deep and meaningful way. It, there is something about having somebody again, being on the same page so that we can pray to the same God and we can, we can, we can get small together. And in those moments of weakness, we can sort of huddle up and say, okay, we can make this. And in those huge expansive moments, look at each other eye to eye and say, and I've got this incredible partner. This is what my prayer early on was, Lord, I want to meet somebody before I become what the world sees me as like, I want to meet somebody now and I want to go on the ride with somebody. I want to go on a ride with a woman that can share all of the ups and downs and know me for me. We've gone through some really lean times where if there was anybody who was superficial or who needed the, the trappings, like she would have bailed having somebody at home to hold the fort down and to keep be steady with the kids and to, to be that support has been essential. How do you stay relationally healthy with your wife? You go through ebbs and flows, but I think that in our best moments, we are together all the time. We go shop, grocery shop together, we talk, we pray together. And I think in our worst moments, it's, you know, if I'm not listening, if I'm distracted, if I'm elsewhere, and when isolation, I think that relationship, and again, I mean, this is a lesson that I'm constantly having to relearn because either you're running and gunning and things are, you're so busy that you're having to hold, like kind of pump the brakes to let everybody, you know, keep up with you, or you're scrambling so hard to get ahead again that you're just like, you know, you, I don't have time for, so for me, it's really about, I got to put the phone down. I got to stop trying to make things happen. I got to drop in and pay attention. And while raising three boys, and trying to be a role model to them and trying to be somebody that's, again, raising men in, in a world where it's hard, like it's a confusing, hard world right now. And so what do you, you know, and, and raising kids that are full of empathy and full of compassion for everybody. And it's easy for me to go to set and be a role model. It's hard to have that kingdom living, you know, at home because it's 24 seven and they see every side of you. Right. They see you when you're right. grumpy. They see you when you're down and out. They see you when you're tired. And my wife sees things that I don't see. And I think that's how we're supposed to be built, men and women. We're different for a reason. And I think when you're coupled with the right person, you've got this balance and you're given a set of eyes that you don't possess for a reason so that you have 360 view versus 180. Let's be here. And so it's about relationship. It's about being relational. It's about staying in relationship. How do you stay spiritually healthy while working in entertainment? There's this book called the Bible. You know, you jump into that when you are feeling scattered to the wind. There was this verse that I read uh, like a year and a half ago. And it was that, G and Jesus says it. And in this one verse, I'd never, you know, read it before in my whole life. And I found it, it was like, which is a thing about the Bible is every time you open it, something will spring forth that you've never seen in that way before. And you're like, holy cow, I'm, my mind is being constantly renewed by this stuff. But it was, Jesus said, you know, when you're invited to a party, seat yourself at the least at the far end of the table, give yourself the very, very back of the room so that when the host comes in and sees that you've sat yourself in the very lowest seat, he brings you up and sits you next to him and gives you honor. 
But woe be to the man who sits himself at the head of the table that when the host comes in, says, you got to move, buddy, you're in my seat. And so this idea of humbling yourself and always taking the lowest position, it hit me in a way that I was like, man, that's how you move through the industry. That's how I should, I should always think of myself as the lowest guy in the, in the room. And then when people come around me and say, well, no, we need you here. We need you here. Let them do it. And I think you and I probably meet a lot of people whose hubris gets in the way of, of a really otherwise perfectly functioning day. And when you see ego get in the way of good work, it's heartbreaking because it's like, man, we've just spent, we've just spent two hours dealing with your ego and not the work and not the story. And it's changed my mindset so much so that I am in you and I, as storytellers, are in the service industry. We are waiters still. We are, we are, we are the people, and all we are doing is bringing stories to people. And if we do a really good job, if we can prepare a really great story, people will want to come back and they'll want to eat it. They'll want to buy it. They'll want to be a part of it. If we're sloppy storytellers, like, or if we're fast food storytellers, like we're, that's it. We're, we're going to be done. And so going to work and treating it like a job that isn't special, that's just another job that needs to be done because it's a service to people. I think it's the right mindset for this industry. 98% of people in SAG are paying to be in that union and only 2% actually working. And it's I, anything other than gratitude is, is shocking because no one is entitled. No one deserves to be there. Like, you know? Yeah. It's crazy to think about because if there, that was a stat for architects, if they said out of the 100% of architects, only 2% of them are making their living as architects, you would think, why does anyone want to be an architect? <laughs> yeah, no one wants to do it. No one's going to do that. We're like nursing. You're going to go spend all this time and energy to be a nurse and only 2% of you are going to actually make money. <laughs> so you just have to have such a crazy passion for it. But then it sounds like what's made a real difference to you is your faith that that has really given you the energy to keep pursuing it, the blessing from it you give to God. So that's really inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. At the end of your life, what kind of legacy would you like to leave behind? You know, when I think about what a life is worth and what success is, I think about my father-in-law. Uh, his name was Max Morris. And Max had this unbelievable life. Like on paper, he was able to speak in Martin Luther King's church. He was the first white Southern Baptist preacher to speak out against segregation. And this was in 1961. He went on crusades with Billy Graham. And then when preaching, he felt no longer called to preach. He started one company that made, you know, a gazillion dollars. And then that company went away and then he started this other thing uh, uh, called the quick scan, which was a type of print that made him and his family a lot of money. Like he'd done all these things that on a, on a paper where you'd say, well, this is a success and this is a success. And, you know, but what was interesting about him was that in the last 20 years of his life, uh, his biggest ambition and his biggest sort of legacy was his family was just being there for his daughter and his son. And then for me and for my kids, what was interesting is that the legacy that he left behind was how encouraging he was and how present he was with us mm -hmm. and how loving he was. Like, I mean, I think back on him and there wasn't a day that didn't go by where he was like, and he had this booming Southern voice. He's from Alabama. He'd be like, son, you are the best father I have ever seen. I never have <laughs> in my life seen a better father than you. And, you know, it's funny. We move through the world thinking that it's all about us and we're waiting for the praise to come to us. But we often forget to like, what if somebody's got to be the one doing the praising? Somebody's got to start pouring out. Eventually, you've got to start shining the light away from yourself. And I think when we're young and when we're ambitious and when we're trying to make our mark in the world and we think in terms of legacy, I think the American mindset is I need to build an empire. I need to have my name on buildings. 
I need to be on the dollar bill. I need to be immortal. I need to be in the Greek pantheon of heroes. I need to leave this. I mean, I need a constellation named after me. I need immortality, right? Because in our hearts, we crave eternity. Hmm. And, and humans have, from the beginning of time, craved eternity because we're going to die. Sadly, my neighbor, who I love, died on Monday of a heart attack. One minute he was riding his Peloton bike, and the next minute he was on the floor and he was gone. He was only 58 years old. I mean, it's awful. It's a tragedy. And I'm sad for his wife and I'm sad for his family. And it is a stark reminder that we have just enough time here on this planet to love each other, <laughs> to be kind. To just dig in and, and yeah, if you get to tell stories for a living or if you get to whatever it is. And I think what we've done is, as Americans, we've created a hierarchy of, well, if you do this, you're really important. And if you do this, you're really important. But if you do this, you're not so important. And if you do this, no one really cares about you. But we really love you if you do this. If you're, if you're a pop star, man, you're like, you've got your... You've got your constellation. And I think that what's even more interesting is the legacy you can leave behind on individual hearts. Do you, when you die, you can ask yourself this very simple question. Do you want people to be glad that you're dead or to be sad that you're dead? And if people are <laughs> glad that you finally kicked the bucket, you probably didn't do your job on earth. But if they're sad that you're dead, then I think you've won the game. I think you've you know, you've ended it on this note of leaving a legacy of people who are like, I miss, I miss that person in this world. Well, thank you so much for being my guest, Chris. <laughs> Sorry to leave it on a note like that, but it's ultimately a joyful note because it's a reminder to, you know, like to myself, to everybody who's listening, just to, you know, <laughs> go for it. And I loved hearing how you have gone for it and just the in impact that you've had both in entertainment with all the roles that you've had, but then on your relationship with your wife, on your kids, like that's the kind of legacy that's going to just continue long after people are forgotten about the movies and the TV show. So it's really inspiring to hear about your priorities and where you put them. If you work in entertainment, check out the complimentary courses and other resources available at navigatinghollywood.org. Please follow us and leave us a review so others can discover this podcast. You can find our other shows, transcripts, links, and more at navigatinghollywood.org. I look forward to being with you next time.